so we've talked about this before, but Stoicism is kind of undergoing a uh, resurgence. Yeah. And I know you've written quite a bit about Stoicism in the past. Right. Can you tell me about, a bit more about that? I know you've kind of sure. linked it to Silicon Valley and you've linked it yeah. to kind of almost like a Western form of Buddhism. Right. Yeah, so Stoicism, uh, kind of ancient Greek philosophy, is very practical. It was a kind of form of therapy for the emotions. It has enjoyed an unlikely revival, I would say, in the last 10 years. The name comes from the Stoa Poikile, which is called the Painted Colonnade, which is a kind of particular street in Athens. They would gather and teach in the streets, so it was kind of open street philosophy. Um, the idea of it is that um, we should live according to nature. Uh, and their definition of nature is that we're rational, moral beings. So we should learn to develop our reason uh, and, and, our, and our virtue. And they thought that would be enough to be happy. So they promised happiness. All you need to be happy is just to develop your virtue. That idea comes from Socrates. And basically, you develop your virtue by um, not being attached to externals or averse to them. So it's quite similar to Buddhism and Taoism and so on in that respect. Seneca, a Stoic philosopher, says, the Stoic sees everything as training. The obstacle is the way. So um, you lose your job, it's conventionally awful, but for the Stoic, it's actually potentially a moment of profound awakening and, and, and liberation from, from, from conventional goods. Um, similar to other spiritual traditions, really, you get a terrible illness. Conventionally, it's awful but it could be morally and spiritually um, awakening. And this theory uh, was the main inspiration for cognitive behavioral therapy. So it's one of the things I looked at in my book. Um, Albert Ellis, the man who invented, really pioneered cognitive behavioral therapy, and Aaron Beck, the other guy who invented it, both were inspired by stoicism and the stoic therapy of the emotions. So what the stoics say is whenever you ha um, have a powerful emotional reaction to, to something, uh, it may feel involuntary and automatic and beyond your control, but actually all emotions involve uh, judgments and beliefs. Uh, you know, like the judgment, that's terrifying and I'm, I'm going to die and that's awful. Or the judgment, you know, that's, uh, she's perfect and desirable and I, I, you know, I, must, I must go out with her or something like that. Um, and you can actually look at um, the belief or judgment underlying an emotion and say, is that definitely true? Is that definitely wise? Do I definitely have to believe that? And so we have some control. We don't always have control over what happens to us, but we have some control over our um, beliefs, our opinions, uh, our interpretation of things. Um, we can choose our perspective. Uh, Marcus Aurelius, the Stoic Emperor, said, life is but what you deem it. Life itself is but what you deem it. So we can choose our perspective on the things that happen to us, and that will affect how we feel. So, uh, for example, uh, when I was younger, I had uh, uh, bad social anxiety, uh, crippling, uh, and that was, I, I, it felt like I'd messed myself up on drugs, and that this was something neurochemical beyond my control. And I thought, God, is it going to be like this for the rest of my life? Have I ruined my life? And maybe there's nothing I can do about it apart from take beta blockers or you know, other drugs. And then through stoicism, I realized, actually, this awful anxiety and terror I feel is connected to my beliefs and my values and my life philosophy, which was unconscious. My unconscious life philosophy, which I got grown up with and got from my family and my school and my culture, was um, basically I must be approved of by all people and if I don't it's a disaster. Uh, the mo you know that my value is very much tied to what other people think of me uh, and I grew up with terrible show-off and I, I, I loved uh, making other people laugh and impressing people and amassing honours and glory so I had a, an identity extremely geared towards external approval and the flip side of that was, 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 was social anxiety. Um, and I kind of, and I thought, God, I'm doing this to myself through my own beliefs, my own unconscious automatic beliefs. And, you know, I could use um, the, the practice of stoicism to become aware of these automatic unconscious uh, beliefs, this, this unconscious life philosophy which is completely shaping my reality, and say that's a dumb way to think. Um, 
you know, that's impossible. You're never going to get everyone to like you. Uh, that, it, it's an unwise philosophy. So uh, you can use the, you know, use the practice in CBT and Stoicism, they call it the Socratic method. Why am I getting so worked up about this? What belief is underlying this emotion? Is that belief definitely true? Um, why am I putting so much emphasis on something that's beyond my control, other people's opinions, and that's quite fickle? Uh, that just, you know, the stock market of public, public opinion is constantly going up or down. So if you make that the basis of your self esteem, you are never going to be stable or happy. Why not bring it back to what's within my control? my own beliefs, my own opinions, why not choose to accept myself even if other people don't? Um, and what I found was that once I started to follow this, this kind of different philosophy, it affected my emotions as well. I stopped having panic attacks, I stopped feeling so anxious. So, um, yeah, so uh, stoicism was extremely helpful to me in terms of kind of coming through uh, that, that anxiety and transforming my thoughts and my beliefs and my emotions and my neurochemistry. I mean, it kind of it changes your kind of whole reality, really. How do you know that it's become really popular now and why do you think that is? Media coverage, for one thing. It's so much more common now to have articles about uh, stoicism. It's, it's, I mean, people don't even have to say stoicism, which, by the way, is an ancient philosophy from Rome. It's, it's, it, you hear it mentioned so much more often uh, in podcasts. Um, you see more and more famous people saying they're into it, um, from Darren Brown to uh, Elle McPherson, who named her son after Marcus Aurelius. Those are the things I see. And why now? People feel out of control. Uh, Stoicism says, accept that, accept you can't control the external world, but you can find a measure of serenity and happiness and moral meaning by focusing on what is in your control, your own beliefs and your own actions. It arose at a time of great political turbulence when the Greek city-states um, were being conquered by marauding empires. Before then, Greek philosophers had always tied the good life to the good society. Stoicism says you can have a good life even in a bad society, even amidst chaos. So, quite good for our times as well. Um, secondly, because of the, the familiarity and popularity with cognitive therapy. Millions and millions of people have been helped by cognitive therapy, or know what it is. Whenever I do a talk on Stoicism, I always say, who here has heard of CBT? It's always like, probably over 50% of people have. Um, now more and more people are aware that of how much CBT owes to Stoicism, both in its theory of the emotions and in specific practices, um, like using a journal, like using maxims, um, like the Socratic method and so on. So Stoicism seems to be a, a kind of rational, evidence-based theory that fits with science. It's a moral philosophy but it kind of fits with science as well. We live in a very skeptical times, so people like that. Um, you can use the techniques of Stoicism, whether you believe in God or not. So it's very popular with atheists and skeptics, um, or with people who, like me, are, are kind of more like theistic. Um, plus, it's, it's from Western culture, so that's interesting. You know, it kind of gives you a way into this wonderful tradition, going back to Socrates, going through Shakespeare, who's very into Stoicism, going through uh, Montaigne, going through the Enlightenment philosophers. Um, you know, it's part of a way, we, we, we've had to turn to things like Tibetan Buddhism or Peruvian shamanism, which are awesome traditions. But we can also find these things in our own culture and have, have a connection to 2,000 years of Western culture. So that's amazing as well. You mentioned before that it's sort of Silicon Valley is somewhere that seems quite yeah. aligned with it. I'm thinking, I don't know if Tim Ferriss has ever talked specifically about Stoicism. Yeah, he did a TED talk on it, yeah. Oh, wow, well, yeah. Because mm. when I think of Tim Ferriss, I think, yeah, there's a real Stoic kind yeah. of quality to a lot of what he's talking about. I didn't know he'd actually done a specific talk about it. Yeah. Well, um, Stoicism, in a way, is quite um, a neat, tidy philosophy for if you have an engineering mind and you want algorithms for life. Like Darren Brown said, the thing he loves about Stoicism is a clear thing. 
is this in my control or not? Uh, you know, if no, accept it. If you get quite, um, you know, anxious about uncertainty or ambiguity, this is a clear algorithm. So engineers love it for that reason. Entrepreneurs love it because um, they have to deal with so much uncertainty. They don't know, we know this has been kind of entrepreneurial ourselves. Um, you know, you, it's status volatility. Uh, you don't know if, you're, if, you're, if your brilliant idea is going to take off and you're going to be, uh, you know, a massive hit or if it's going to kind of slump and you might have experiences, tastes of both. Um, so, uh, so entrepreneurs have to deal with that, like from going from feeling like a god to a kind of nobody. Uh, and so stoicism gives them a way to, for, to help them find a sense of security, inner security and inner meaning that is not dependent on that stock market of public opinion. Um, and it helps them uh, deal with risk and, and the, the, the fear of failure. And so I think that's why Tim Ferriss is particularly into it, his, his TED Talks on using Stoicism to cope with the fear of failure. And plus, of course, Stoics, um, ancient Stoics, were not ascetics. Um, they were people of the world. Like Seneca was both a Stoic and one of the richest men in the Roman Empire. Um, Marcus Aurelius probably had a few bob as well. Yeah, yeah. He was, he was the emperor of Rome. Um, so, yeah, if you're out in the world as well, this is in a way a philosophy of inner detachment, but not of going off to a cave or becoming a monk. So in some ways it kind of fits with Western society more obviously than Buddhism, which was a, mainly a philosophy for ascetics, for monks. It seems very Christian influenced, but Stoicism predates Christianity? Yeah, no, Christianity is Stoic influenced. So what's the common ancestor, if there is a common ancestor? Christianity is directly influenced by Stoicism and by Greek philosophy. Um, Stoic, Greek Christianity is a mashup of Judaism and Greek philosophy. Um, uh, so the, 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 the Gospel of John says Jesus is the Logos made flesh, um, which is a great idea in a way, you know, because Greek philosophy has this idea of the divine, but it's a rather intellectual, abstract principle. Um, and Christianity says, okay, you know that, that's a person who died for you. Uh, and, uh, you know, as Hinduism found, uh, Hinduism did something similar with the Bhagavad Gita. Before that, it had this idea of the Brahman, this intellectual principle. It's a bit difficult to really love that intellectual principle. So they said, yes, and, and you know, that's actually Krishna, this, this, this wonderful being. So the Bhagavad Gita is taking that kind of abstract intellectual monotheism of the Upanishads and turning it into a much more of a devotional thing centered on a, on a person. But um, yeah, the early you know, Christianity was deeply influenced by um, Greek philosophy and by Stoicism. Uh, the early Christian fathers uh, were, were really literate on, on Greek philosophy. Um, Augustine uh, uh, was, was, was a Neoplatonist before he was a Christian, and he took loads of his Neoplatonism with him. Uh, later Christian mystics like St. Teresa of Avila, her nickname for St. John of the Cross, who, who kind of lived uh, with him, was My Little Seneca. Um, uh, yeah, so uh, Nietzsche said that Christianity is just um, Platonism for the masses. Um, but there's, there's, there's all kinds of similarities. And in fact, I, mean, I, I was a Christian briefly, and I thought it was a real pity that modern Christians don't have that awareness of, of Greek philosophy, because it's really great practical wisdom. You know, in, in the modern church, if you have problems, the only therapy solution is basically to um, surrender to Jesus more. They've lost all those practical exercises, those practical psychological techniques, which earlier Christians had, partly through kind of Greek philosophy. But I remember having to give a testimony at an evangelical church, and they said, um, and I told them about this near-death experience I had, and, and they said, and did that lead you to Jesus? And I said, no, it led me to Greek philosophy, and there was this awful kind of silence in the church, um, because anything that's not Jesus is often kind of seen as suspicious and possibly demonic in the modern church. 
rather than this kind of generalist you know, pluralism where in earlier times in Christian history they would say, um, I mean, Socrates and Seneca were pretty much worshipped as saints in the Middle Ages. Um, yeah, they were seen as almost kind of prophets.